This is Frank Chase back with you again. It's been a while since I've been with you, but uh, I wanted to uh, get back with you and share some uh, more issues and concerns about tithing. And so today, I want to do something different than I've done before. Uh, I want to go through some of my research material. I want to share some of the books that I've read on the subject matter. Uh, to kind of give you an idea the extent to which I went through to do the research for my book, Kleptomaniac, Who's Really Robbing God Anyway? And uh, and I, what I'd like to do today is I want to share some quotes or excerpts, small excerpts from some of the books that I've read, and to kind of give you an idea that I wasn't talking out the side of my mouth or out the side of my head or off the top of my head when I wrote a book about tithing, dispelling all the myths that a tithe is 10% of your income. And uh, before we get started, I want to probably read a quote to you, and we're going to come back and do that, but I want to read a quote to you about uh, from a young lady, I guess from a, a, an older lady, that um, really touched my heart uh, concerning my book. She bought my book, she read it, and she wrote me uh, a little note. And I can tell you when I read the, the little note, it really, really kind of almost brought a tear to my eye. Because after writing this book and getting all the pushback and the rejection, it was almost as if I really, did I waste my time doing the book? Did I really, really waste my time writing the book? But there are some times in life when people write you comments that really let you know that you're on the right track. And we'll be right back, and I'm going to read that quote to you in just a minute. We're back, and so now I want to share with you uh, this little excerpt from a reviewer who read my book, and it was powerful. It was touching, and um, I, I still read it from time to time because it lets me know that the work that I've done to put into writing the book Kleptomaniac, Who's Really Robbing God Anyway, was worth it all. And here's what I wrote to my friends of Kleptomaniac on Facebook. And it reads, Friends, writing my tithing book, Kleptomaniac, Who's Really Robbing God Anyway, cost me a lot emotionally and spiritually to include loss of friends. But there are certain times that I get inspired that my journey to go against the tradition of tithing is worth it all. I received a book review from a reader that made me say, wow. It touched my heart greatly. The reviewer is Ms. Bryant, and she wrote, and I quote, Thank you for your courage. I am a devoted Christian who has chosen to be a full-time wife and mother instead of chasing the mighty dollar. Your book, Kleptomaniac, Who's Really Robbing God Anyway, has helped to set me free from guilt. Thank you for helping me stop thinking of God as a mafia godfather and torturing myself when a car repair, doctor's visit, helping my aging parents or any other expense prevents me from giving more. God bless you. And then I close my uh, statement on Facebook by saying, I want to say to Miss Bryant, thank you, and I am joyful that I wrote the book, and the impact of the book on your life is powerful and redemptive. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is worth it all. If I had to do it all over again and lose all the friends and and maybe not be involved in the institutional church anymore, it was worth it all for the truth of the tithe. We're going to come back, and I'm going to start sharing with you some things about how this book came about, uh, some of the books that I've read, and I'm going to share some quotes or some excerpts from it, small sentences and small paragraphs, that you will probably understand that this book was not done uh, hastily, it was thoroughly researched, and you can count your bottom dollar that if you read it, you're going to get an education on tithing you have never been 
exposed. Gentlemen, let's get started. And uh, I want to, to say, first of all, that for all the people who have read my book, Kleptomaniac, Who's Really Robbing God Anyway?, I want to say thank you for your comments on Facebook. Thank you for your reviews on uh, Amazon. I want to say uh, I appreciate all of your reviews, and I do hope that you share the book with others to help set people free from financial tyranny. So I want to say this starting out. You know, a lot of people start talking about um, what they start talking about in tithing is they always like to go to Hebrews and um, try to justify the tradition of tithing uh, money by using Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, But in, if you read it very closely, if Hebrews chapter 7 is basically disannulling the tithe, setting aside the tithe. Uh, and uh, and sometimes you when you read things, you find out that you're not the only one who sees that very clearly, uh, but other people do too. So let me read something to you here. In Hebrews 7.18, Paul penned a pivotal verse in understanding the tithe. He wrote, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment. Odd enough to the tithe, when it comes to commandments of any kind in Hebrews 7, the strict exegesis of the tithe commandment Hebrews 7 and 5. Indeed, Paul references no other commandment within that chapter or many surrounding chapters. As a result, the disannulling of the commandment is none other than a setting aside of Levi's tithe commandment for the Christian. So if you read Hebrews very closely, Paul is setting aside the biblical tithe. He is not endorsing it. He is setting it aside. That's the commandment that was set aside in Hebrews chapter 7. Not the others. He only mentioned one. Setting aside or disannulling of the commandment. And the only commandment is the tithe that God gave to the Levites is now set aside. So why are you paying money as a tithe? Go <laughs> into some of these books that I've read doing my research for my book, Kleptomaniac, Who's Really Robbing God. One of the books that I read is called The Tithing Hoax. Um, and uh, you probably want to see that right here. This is the, the Tithing Hoax. And you can, and I believe in sharing other people's books, by the way, who've written on this subject, because I know that the doctrine of tithing is so strong that, uh, You've got to be able to share other people's books, and I hope people share mine. And here's what she said, um, the lady R. Renee and Cynthia Harper. Here's what she, a quote from her book, says about the storehouse. Now, we know the storehouse is always associated with the church. But in my book and in her book, and I have never met this uh, author, we are saying the same thing. Here's what she says. The biblical storehouse is not a place for religious worship. A storehouse is not the same as a church. According to biblical scriptures, a storehouse is where crops, grain, wine, and oils were stored. Uh, and by the way, in my book, I even go into even more detail about the storehouse. It was, in fact, nothing more than a barn. Go figure. Continue on, ladies and gentlemen, on sharing some of the books. Um, before I share the next book, I want to say, why is the tithing doctrine so strong? Why is it the doctrine so powerful in people's lives? Well, one of my uh, suspicions is the fact that when you threaten people with the fear of a curse from God, that is a power in powerful incentive to make people cough up that 10%, by the way. And so if you are in that kind of fear and a fearful of God, when the scripture says God has not given us the spirit of fear, then 
you can get any amount of money out of a person you want when it is always associated with a uh, disastrous calamity that's going to come from God. And and I'm glad that this uh, young lady that wrote me my review, it, it, isn't it strange that her, that with until she read my book, she thought of God as a powerful mafia boss? Oh my goodness, that is just unbelievable that somebody would think of God as a mafia boss because they feel like they got to cough up the tithe and or God was going to cut off or cut off a leg or an arm or chop off their knees or break their knees like the mafia. So I'm glad that the book set her free. And um, I hope my book continues to set other people free from the doctrine of tithing for centuries. Now, the next book, uh, this author call, is simply called The Tithe. The Tithe. Um, and uh, I want to say to this book, uh, the, the author's wife wrote me on my blog at tithenomore.com and thanked me for sharing her husband's book on my blog. Um, he has since passed away, but she thanked me and I, I really appreciated her comments on the book. And I don't know if she read my book or not, but uh, she did mention that she appreciated me sharing her husband's book. Now, he says something about tithing as, 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 as it relates to uh, ignorance. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of people who are ignorant about the tithe. And that's because they simply have not studied. And the Bible is clearly saying that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And there is certainly a lack of knowledge on tithing amongst the entire body of believers. Here's what they say, or here's what he says. Uh, James DeFazio, to teach the tithe as a method that the Lord desires for us to give in our churches or to say that tithing means giving is either of the following. An uninformed or an uneducated use of the term by an individual who does not yet know the truth. Basic ignorance. A pastor or teacher who has never studied the issues of tithing and giving and how each relates to the issues of law and grace would fit this basic category. An uninformed and or undereducated use of the term by an individual who does not desire to know the truth Willful ignorance, a pastor or teacher who has willfully decided not to study the issues of tithing and giving, law and grace, would fit this category. An informed, conscious use of the term by someone who does know the truth, but chooses to directly misrepresent its truth and intended meaning. Rebellious ignorance, a pastor or teacher who has no desire to study God's word on the areas of tithing and giving or law and grace for fear of being made aware of something he does not want to know or the pastor teacher who does know the truth concerning these issues but chooses to willingly ignore its teaching would fit this category. So we got a lot of willful ignorance going on, ladies and gentlemen. We got some rebellious ignorance going on and we've got some basic ignorance going on. And so there's a lot of ignorance going on about the tithe. And you better believe it, because I used to be that ignorant too. We'll be right Well, we are back. I hope you're getting something out of this. Uh, it's, it's important, definitely important, to study the doctrine of tithing, because if you don't, you could be headed to financial ruin. Uh, many tricks, many tricks and, and false teachings and misappropriation of scripture, taking scripture out of context is rampant in the body of Christ when it comes to the teaching of tithing. And so it behooves you as a believer to make sure that you take your scriptures out and study them in context not based on what it just says, but in context, based on history and based on exegesis and hermeneutics. You've got to include all of those, those functions in the process of interpretation and studying the scripture. Now, 
Uh, the next book I uh, want to read a quote from is uh, by Benny Prince. And as you can see, it says, Why Tithing is Not for the Church. So let's uh, read what he has to say. I will end this chapter by pointing out how the tithing doctrine contradicts a number of New Testament doctrines. Tithing doctrines contradicts New Testament doctrines? Well, let's see what he has to say. First, it contradicts the teachings of grace found in Galatians 3.14 by teaching that blessings are earned through tithing rather than freely given by unmerited grace through Christ. Second, it teaches, it teaches that tithing and not Christ is our source of blessing. Thirdly, Galatians 3.13 informs us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. However, according to the tithing doctrine, we must tithe to avoid the curse, which is tantamount to saying that Christ has failed to redeem us from the curse of the law. Fourth, and lastly, tithing clearly contradicts the New Testament instructions for giving in 2 Corinthians 9.7, which states that each believer is to freely give according to his own determination. I will point out one last thing, which is that the church does not even follow the, follow the cycle of tithing, which is outlined for all to see in the Bible. Tithing has a three cycle. Deuteronomy 26 and 12. During the first two years, Two of the tithes are required, which is a total of 20% of the increase. The cycle ends in the third year when a tithe for the poor is added to bring about three tithes for the total of 30% of the increase. And the word increase has nothing to do with money. And I explain that in my book on what increase is. Increase is based on the crops, not on your cash. Uh, so let's look at another author. Let's look at another author real quick here. Um, this is author Jeff Ferris, God's Economy, The Tithe, and New Testament Giving. Okay, so let's look at this. Here's what he has to say about the tithe. The Old Testament tithe was for Israel under the law and of Moses. Within that economy, its priests and Levites received regular offerings from the people who worked the land and raised livestock. That economy ended twice, the first time during the Babylonian captivity, and the other happened in A.D. 70 with the destruction of the Jerusalem and its temple. When, the Israel's, economy, when Israel's economy ended, the tithes and offerings associated with it also ended. No temple, no priesthood, no priesthood, no tithes and offerings. There you have it. Without the temple, the whole tithing system is ended. Null and void, over, gone, done with. So you can see, I'm not the only one writing that the tithe, the modern day financial monetary tithe is a hoax. It's truly a hoax, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be right back. We are back again, and we're going to go through a whole bunch of books. I'm not, I'm not going to probably be able to go through all of them in this video. I probably will have to do a, another one uh, down the road. Uh, so this book right here is a uh, uh, it's pretty an old book. It's really old. It's called The Lie of the Tithe. The Lie of the Tithe. <laughs> uh, and his author goes through and uses a lot of humor in the book to explain the tithe, but he is really tough uh, on, the, uh, on the tithe teaching. And so uh, many of you have probably heard about uh, Jacob's tithe at one point in time, about Jacob. Everybody talks about tithing and and all of this stuff, but nobody really goes into the reality about what Jacob's tithe was all about. And uh, I did so in my book. I went and it did a little bit of extensive analysis of Jacob's tithe and Jacob's promise to tithe. And um, 
But he has something to say about it, and I want to share with you what this author has to say about Jacob's tithe in reference to how did he pay it. That's if he even paid a tithe, which he did not. But listen to what this author says. The test question about Jacob's tithing habits. Where was Jacob going to pay his tithe? Hmm. Interesting question, right? There was no synagogue or temple. There was not a Levitical priesthood. Moses was long way from being born. God had not given the law yet. And yet Jacob talked about paying a tithe. So where and how was Jacob going to pay his tithes? If tithing was about money, Jacob had a real problem at this point. Was he going to throw the 10% he promised to God on the rock that he slept on? <laughs> how was Jacob going to give God a tenth? Was God going to send down an offering plate weekly? Maybe Jacob was going to just throw the tithe up into the air and God could catch it somehow. <laughs> Tithing is not about money. And I've been saying this in all of my videos. So what was the principle of tithing in the Old Testament? The principle of tithing was the tithe was eaten by the tither. That's the first principle. The second principle was that tithing was to be only on the increase. Only on the increase. And let me explain this because I did this in another video. I explained this. If a cattle herder in the cycle of birth of his calves or cows or bulls in that cycle, in the sabbatical cycle, in the time of the tithe, if you only had nine calves that were birthed during that cycle, you did not tithe because it had to be the 10th animal that was tithed, the 10th calf, the 10th bull that was tithed. If you had nine, you did not tithe. So it was only on the increase. The third principle of tithing. Tithing was directly between the tither and God. That's it. The fourth principle. The tithe or you're supposed to give to those in need around you. That's what, that was what the tithe was for in the Old Testament. You fed the poor. You fed the unfortunate. You fed the Levites, the, all of the farmers and herders fed the Levites. They gave the Levites a part of the tithe at all times during the sabbatical cycle. And so there you have it from the lie of the tithe. Uh, now let's look at another uh, book. And this one is uh, interesting. This is probably one of the first books I read. Uh, this is A. Bruce Wells, A. Bruce Wells, tithing nailed to the cross. Uh, here's what he says about the tithe. And he specifically talks about Abraham because everybody loves to talk about Abraham or Abram uh, being the example that we should follow to tithe. But uh, if we're going to follow Abram's example, ladies and gentlemen, Abram didn't tithe any money. So we got to follow his example. We're supposed to tithe the spoils of war, by the way. The truth is, Abram was very rich before he ever met with Melchizedek, and I made this clear in my book. And his righteousness came from believing God, not from tithing. Huh, did you hear that? Read Romans chapter 4. The more this abolished doctrine is cultivated, that means the tithe, the bolder ministers grow in saying almost anything to make tithing legitimate. This is the multiplied fruit of bad seed. This tithing doctrine, ladies and gentlemen, is bad, bad seed. Um, and you're not going to reap anything from it. You're going to reap financial ruin uh, from it. Now, and and don't, don't play me now because I know a lot of people who have went through financial ruin from tithing. And... And, and then pastors are slick by saying, well, that happened to them because they didn't really believe. It's not about belief. It's what the tithe really is. And in the Hebrew, ma'asar, and according to Josephus, the tithe is everything edible. And you better believe it because that's the truth. We'll be right back with another <music> And 
let's go back and do some more of this uh, reading. Here's another book, <coughs> excuse me, by, um, <clears throat> by the Great Tithing Debate. This is A. Bruce Wells also. And um, here's what he has to say about if tithing really works. If tithing really works, a constant flow of more than enough abundance, health, peace, and security would be evident in the lives of most tithers. But the truth is, they usually sustain a hard hand-to-mouth existence. And those who do look successful often have problems that no one connects to the curse of the law, which is sickness, divorce, and even death in the family. All tithers seem to be wanting, waiting for the big wealth transfer. Oh man, I remember those sermons. I was waiting for the big wealth transfer uh, and I would be overwhelmingly rich uh, beyond measure. They waiting for that wealth transfer that's supposed to happen any day now. I guess they're going to win the lottery or something. Or maybe God is going to make all the sinners give their hard-earned money to them. Not going to happen. <laughs> of course, he hasn't done that yet, but maybe he will someday. For those of you who are thinking, but the Egyptians gave all their money to the Jews. You need to realize that God did that because the Egyptians owed the Hebrews for years of hard labor. God is very exacting when it comes to laborers being oppressed in their wages. I have seen him put large companies completely out of business when they cheated their employees. There are many warnings in the Bible concerning this sort of thing. In Egypt, the Hebrews were simply getting paid for brick-making services already rendered. Now, wow, that is a powerful statement. That is a powerful, powerful statement. And um, I want to also read something else from his book. And this has directly to go back to what I said earlier about the increase. Here's a little tidbit. You're not tithing the way it was meant to be done anyway. If you're going to operate under the old covenant, there were actually three different kinds of tithes to be paid. Now, I want to put an asterisk here because there are other authors who say there was one tithe paid in the Old Testament, but it was used three different ways. And so the tithe, the three tithes were paid off of one single tithe. But um, that's not the issue of this uh, particular video. But I just wanted to make that point to you. Continuing on with the story here. Are you doing them all? Are you doing all three tithes in the Old Testament? Because there were three separate tithes or three tithes paid in the Old Testament. Are you doing them now? Also, tithing is supposed to be done on the increase. And not everyone was required to do it. And I made that clear. Your salary is not really increased. And I've been telling, people have told me that for years and years and years in the church, that uh, my, my salary, my income was my increase. And I believed it. And then when I start studying, I found out, wait a minute, my money is not my increase. And here's what he says. You only traded time and effort for dollars. That's not an increase. It's a trade-off or a wash. So what are you doing? You selling your talent to get a check. It's a trade-off, ladies and gentlemen. You're selling your talent for a check to an employer. You're selling your services. You're selling what you can do for them, and they can give you money for your services. It's not tithing, ladies and gentlemen. That's not a tithe. That's not an increase. You're selling something to get something. Huh. Well, it's really hard to accept some of these things because when you hear them for the first time, you're often blown away, and as I was. But ladies and gentlemen, don't be blown away. Just simply study the truth and accept it and walk a different way and keep your money in your pocket. <laughs>
so now this author is making a point about this eternal principle that we were talking about in the previous video. And I want to read what he says about the eternal principle. Okay. He says, not an eternal principle. Why did Abraham give Melchizedek a tithe? That's the question. Some say he was following an eternal principle. And I know that's to be true because that's the way it is taught. That couldn't be true because God himself gave specific instructions that were different in Numbers chapter 31. So if you jump over to Numbers chapter 31 and look at the tithe instructions, and then you look at Abram's tithe instructions, they are totally different. Abram's tithe is strictly spools of war, ladies and gentlemen. It had nothing to do with the law. It was strictly spools of war based on a custom that happened in the Old Testament. When you fight battles and you defeat other kingdoms, you bring the spoils to the priest of the, of the winning kingdom. And Abraham did that. And now, let me say this about the tithe. And this author has already made the statement too. He says, as long as your mind is open to the possibility that you should tithe, it will also be open to weakness, to confusion, error, and double-mindedness. So you've got to be able to change your mind on the tithe so that you can understand how you have been deceived. Now let's look at another book, another book. Here we go again, tithing. You don't have to pay to give. <laughs> now all of these books I read, ladies and gentlemen, from cover to cover, Back cover to front cover, front cover to back cover. I read all of these books. I did extensive research. Now, here's what this author says about uh, Melchizedek. A lot of people in these books really focused on Melchizedek because they want that's where the whole tithing doctrine has been established. The monetary tithe doctrine has been established. But when you knock out one leg of this three-pronged doctrine, the whole house of cards comes falling down. And that's what my book did. My book, Kleptomaniac, knocked off one of the legs and the house of cards of tithing has come tumbling down. And it will come tumbling down for you if you have an open mind to really study the subject matter. Here's what the author says. He says, how did Abram's one time giving to Mechizelech translate into, translate into us paying 10% to the church every week? I began to question the validity of this teaching. If we give to Jesus after the order of Melchizedek, we should only give to Jesus once. You get the point here? But we cannot give to Jesus physically like Abraham did to Melchizedek. As a matter of fact, there has not been anyone in history who has won a battle and given a tenth of the spoil to Jesus physically. You see the connection here, ladies and gentlemen? We do not have to give Jesus a tenth of our money as a representation of Abraham giving a tenth of the spool to Melchizedek. And Abraham definitely did not continue giving 10% of his personal earnings to Melchizedek, yet we have been taught that we must personally give a tenth of our earnings to Jesus continually for the rest of our lives. And I debunked this teaching Throughout my book, Abram gave a tithe once to Melchizedek and never repeated it. And so, if someone wants to insist on a monetary tithe, which is actually incorrect biblically, hermeneutically, and exegetically, then you can only give a tenth of your income one time, like Abraham did. <laughs>
And uh, he gives a little excerpt on each one. And let me read that what is to you. Levite's tithe was given to the priests by the Levites, and it is described in Numbers chapter 18, 25 through 32. The Levite's tithe was one-tenth of the grain, fruits, nuts of first tithe. Then you had a festival tithe, it says. The festival tithe was given three times a year by the tither himself to be used by him and his family at the three mandatory festivals. Festival tithe is described in Deuteronomy 12, 6, and 7. Deuteronomy 11 and 12, 6, and 7, verse 11, 12, uh, 17 through 21, and chapter 14, 22 through 26. Then you had the poor tithe. The poor tithe was given in years six, years three, six of the Sabbath cycle for the arable land. Uh, the poor tithe is described in Deuteronomy chapter 14, 27 through 29, and uh, Deuteronomy 26, 12 through 14. And then you had... Um, that's the four tithe. Then you had the first tithe. Let's see what you got here. And then you had the uh, first tithe. The first tithe, which was the Levites' tithe, is described in Numbers 18, 21 through 24, was the tithe the Levites received from the other tribes themselves. The first tithe was considered a heave offering from Israel to the Lord. And then you have the Levites' tithe, again, explained, in uh, Numbers 18, 25 through 30, is the grain of the threshing floor as the fullness of the wine press, indicating the tithe was from food crops only, no animals. Levites' tithe was what the Levites gave the priests out of the first tithe. The priests were the male members of the family of Aaron in the tribe of Levi. The Levites were all the members of the tribe of Levi except the family of Aaron. And as you can see, um, the Levites tithe and all these different tithes were going on. And as you can see, we as believers today have no clue what the tithe practice was in the Old Testament because nobody has really studied the practice. And even me trying to study it was often, wow, complicated because there were so many different things going on with the tithe and trying to understand the Sabbath and the Sabbath cycle. So everything was related to the land and to the animal kingdom and to the crops. So let's look at another um, book. Now, this book is called The Tithing Dilemma, The Tithing Dilemma. And it's an apt title because there is a dilemma going on in the tithing world. OK, now let's look at what uh, this one. He's going to talk about who did not tithe in this particular excerpt. Uh, here's what it reads. Since farmers and ranchers are responsible for paying the tithe, we now come to an equally important question. Who was not required to tithe? It is often surprising to people to find a, that a large segment of the people in Israel did not tithe. Can you believe that, ladies and gentlemen? The owner of the farm had to tithe, but his hired hands were exempt. Was a hired hand required to tithe on his salary? Not at all. There was no law that required a tenth of one's salary to be tithed, which was earned for services rendered. Only the crops and animals of those who owned them were subject to the tithe. After all, crops and the animals did not belong to the hired hand and only the increase from one's land or animals was subject to the tithe. Get this, ladies and gentlemen, get this. This is good stuff. And note this, fishermen did not tithe, though this industry is mentioned in the law, Leviticus, 9, Leviticus 11, 9 through 12. Likewise, the mining industry is referred to in Deuteronomy 8 and 9, but the tithe of minerals extracted from the earth was never called for. The lumber business is mentioned in 1 Kings 5, 7 through 12, and construction work on buildings in 1 Kings 5, 13 through 18, 
but tithes were not extracted from people who worked in those trades. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Old Testament proves if you work in the lumber business, the fishing business, the mining business, your money is not a tithable commodity. So the Bible proves itself. Let's keep on. The same held true for those earning an income from weaving, handcrafts, or from any form of manufacturing or merchandising. They were all immune from tithing, including all those in the military and government workers. <laughs> That's funny, ladies and gentlemen. You want to know why? Because I'm a government worker and I'm supposed to pay a tithe. <laughs> Not so, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> And though the Levites were commanded to pay the tenth of the tithe they received from the farmers and ranchers to the priests, those priests themselves were totally exempt from paying any tithe. The high priest did not tithe, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I tell you, uh, the more you read and the more you study, the more you learn and the more you realize how deceptive deception is on tithing. <laughs> Do this again. This is getting good, and I and uh, I'm not going to be able to share all of the books that I read, but I just wanted to share this uh, hefty a bit of books that I did read and researching for my book Kleptomaniac, who's really robbing God. So this author I have actually talked to on the telephone uh, about his journey uh, to discovering tithing, and his title of his book is uh, Sunday Morning Stick Up. I think this is a very uh, apt title for what's going on in the church today. So let's look at what he says about the tithe. And, and um, a lot of these authors really focus on Abram or Abraham. And so the this author, because if everybody is saying the same thing, that means there must be some truth to it when everybody is coming to the conclusion that Abraham did something and only did something once. So this author goes to the point of making that clear too. He says, there are no recorded instances of where Abraham paid tithes as a lifelong practice. Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek as a one-time event. Get that, ladies and gentlemen. He did it once. So if people want you to follow Abraham's example, you tithe once and never again in your life. But that's still out of context because the tithe was never money. Let me continue. Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek as a one-time event. No one ever told you this. And I felt that it was important that you knew this important fact. If this is the scriptural example that pastors use as a model for giving tithes, I would more than happy to tithe as Abraham did. Abraham's tithe, Abraham tithed once. No record is shared in the scriptures anywhere else where Abram practiced a lifestyle of giving tithes. Abram Ham was extremely wealthy because he obeyed God. This took place before he met Melchizedek. When he gave Melchizedek tithes, he did not he did not do so out of the wealth contained in Genesis chapter 13. That's where Abram's wealth was obtained. He never gave not one dime of money out of his wealth that he amassed in Genesis chapter 13. Let me continue. This is important. He did not give tithes out of his possessions. He gave tithes out of his repossessions. He did not pay tithes out of his possessions. He paid tithes out of his repossessions. In other words, Abraham paid tithes out of someone else's possessions. <laughs> not his own money, ladies and gentlemen. And this is going to be the last book that I'm going to share with you in this video because it's getting pretty long now. And this is uh, some college friends of mine from Washington State University, Beyond Ties and Offerings. Uh, I know these gentlemen very well and have spoken to them about their journey to discovering the truth about tithing. And so they talk about uh, a little passage here concerning first fruits. Now, let me say this. There are a lot of people out there running around in January, talking about you paying your first fruits of your first paycheck or your first day's salary or your first paycheck in the new year or your first day's salary in the new year or your first week's salary or your first day's salary 
or and um and this is getting the madness is continuing every January. People are coming up, coming up with this first fruits, and I dispelled this first fruits doctrine extremely well in the book. Uh, and by the way, uh, if you hear all these people such as Paula White and many others, um, Jake's, uh, all of the other people out there talking about first fruits, be no be it known to you that first fruits is not money. It really is not. They ask it for people's first years, first year's paycheck, first week's paycheck. Do not cough up that money, ladies and gentlemen. It is not a first fruit. Here's what the author says. First fruits is the first of the crops or fruit that ripen and is subsequently gathered. It is an edible substance such as wheat, oil, wine, and corn. Check Leviticus 2.14, 23.17, Numbers 18.12, Deuteronomy 18.4, 2 Chronicles 31.5, and is grown in the land or soil. Exodus 23.16, 19.34.26, 34.26, and Deuteronomy 26.10. The giving of the first fruits is seasonal and is gathered year by year. Nehemiah 10.35. First fruits is the kind of fruit that is literally eaten and also permissible to eat. Not the forbidden kind like that in the Garden of Eden nor the monetary kind some people teach today. The following verses in each section show the first fruits as being crops from the field or fruit from the tree. So let me read you Exodus 23, 16. Celebrate the feast of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Ladies and gentlemen, First fruits is not money. And don't you ever let nobody trick you into thinking that first fruits is money. If they do, tell them this. Stop using eisegesis to interpret the scripture. Eisegesis is imposing your own interpretation on the verse based on your culture, based on your own personal meaning and private interpretation. Eisegesis is not uh, is is a, is an is an act of putting into the scripture what you want to put in. Exegesis is pulling from the verse what is clearly shown, and it's clearly shown that first fruits is not your first paycheck of the year, your first week's pay, or your first day's pay. So toss it out, keep your money, and learn what the tithe is. Well, I'll stop here, ladies and gentlemen, for this segment, and uh, I'll try to come back again uh, with some more books. If I don't, this should give you a hefty research journey in reading some of these books yourselves, and including my book. If you want to check out my blog, check it out at tithenomore.com. I have a lot of information out there that you could share and read and study and research for yourself. Well, We'll see you later, ladies and gentlemen, and 